Hello and welcome to Reading Red Hawks. My name is Stephanie Jamison and I serve as the Assistant Director for Mission, Spirituality and Vocation in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at Seattle University. As we begin our gathering, we respectfully acknowledge that while we are physically located all over the world, we are all on occupied indigenous land and Seattle University is located on occupied Coast Salish land and is on the homelands of the Duwamish people. We pay respect to Coast Salish elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people. To acknowledge this land is to recognize its longer history and our place in that history. It is to recognize these lands and waters and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this region, whose practices and spiritualities were and are tied to the land and the water and whose lives continue to enrich and develop in relationship to the land, waters and other inhabitants today. This Reading Red Hawk session on Imagining Seattle features the book's author, Dr. Saren Houston, as well as SU professor, Dr. Jasmine Mahmood. Jasmine Mahmood is an urban ethnographer and performance historian who engages contemporary artistic practices, race, policy, and geography. She teaches um, in the bachelor's as well as in the um, master's in fine arts courses in the arts leadership program, including the fundamentals of the arts sector, public policy and advocacy in the arts and summary project, as well as the social justice course in the nonprofit leadership program. Um, Dr. Mahmood will tell us a little bit more about Dr. Houston shortly. Um, today's program will flow as follows. Jasmine will open and introduce Dr. Houston, then we'll hear from Dr. Houston, and then uh, we'll have a Q&A facilitated by Dr. Mahmood, and then we'll open up for audience question and answer, and then in closing, uh, we'll be reminded about tomorrow's event in the materials that will help you to dive deeper into that exercise. And now without further ado, I will hand it over to Jasmine. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you all for being here. I'm so excited that you're here today. Um, it is when I always say this when I teach. It is Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. I hope all of you all are doing well. I know it's been a long year, so we're really grateful that you're here to gather with us virtually. I'm excited to introduce you to our first Arts Leadership Book Club of the Year. Um, arts, the Arts Leadership Book Club was convened by my colleague, Roxy Hornbeck, who's a professor in the Arts Leadership Program, who's on the Zoom call in the 2018-2019 school year. And so this is kind of the third uh, season of our book clubs. And each of these, we really like to center around the text and kind of an engagement around the text. Um, we're so happy to be partnering with Stephanie's office and the SU uh, alumni office and, um, and the Reading Red Hawks program. And we're also really, really excited that um, the author, Professor Saren Houston is here today to talk about her research. I'm gonna introduce um, Professor Houston and then she'll talk for about 25, 30 minutes and then we'll have time for Q and A. Um, so thank you for being here. Also, you're welcome to turn your camera off especially kind of during the talk and then back on to be more engaged when we go into Q&A. So um, Professor Saren D. Houston is a faculty member in the Department of Geography and International Relations at Mount Holyoke College. She received a Master's of Arts in Geography from the University of Washington, Seattle, and a PhD in Geography and a Certificate of Advanced Study in Women and Gender Studies from Syracuse University. Her research draws on qualitative methods and a geographic perspective to examine questions of equity and justice from the individual to the global scale. In addition to her book, Imagining Seattle, Social Values and Urban Governance 2019, which we will be discussing today, Saren conducts research on US sanctuary policies and social movements, climate change and human migration, and global local community engagement. Saren has presented her research at a variety of conferences and published and edited collections and in several journals such as Geographical Review, Latino Studies, Studies in Social Justice, Gender, Place and Culture, and Progress in Human Geography. At Mount Holyoke, Saren teaches courses on world regions, cities, migration, research methods, and a sense of place slash planet. Let's all give a warm applause. I like the ASL applause for Professor Saren Houston, and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Jasmine, and thank you all for being here. 
Um, as you know, my name is Saren Houston and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and it's an honor to be with you today. Um, thank you for coming to this session of the Arts Leadership Book Club. And I'd like to begin also my talk by acknowledging that Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, Massachusetts, where I work and live, occupy Nonatuck land. And I ask too that we pay our respects to the Nonatuck and in other indigenous stewards of the lands and waters in Western Massachusetts and to the indigenous peoples wherever we are each individually situated. I invite you to share in the chat where you are located um, and to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have lived in the places where we each are, who live here now, and who will live here in the future. Acknowledgement that we come together on colonized land is a critical public intervention, a necessary step towards honoring indigenous communities and joining the broader endeavor to decolonize spaces engaged in knowledge production. I would like to thank today's organizers and generous sponsors. It's been wonderful collaborating with Dr. Jasmine Mahmood over the past few months. I am truly grateful for the opportunity to be in dialogue um, with all of you today. And I express my appreciation to the Seattle University Alumni Office, Program in Arts Leadership, Arts Leadership Book Club, and the Endowed Mission Fund for sponsoring this event. So thank you all so much. And I'd like to, I'll just share my screen now and pull up my PowerPoint. So I'm thrilled to discuss my book, Imagining Seattle, Social Values and Urban Governance with you. Um, Dr. Mahmood invited me to give a brief overview of my book and to read a couple excerpts before we move into a dialogue together. So I chose to conduct research in Seattle because this city, as I'm sure you all know, is a profoundly storied landscape. One where residents describe in exacting detail favorite local coffee shops and restaurants where the mountain, Mount Rainier, figures prominently in depictions of the place and where changes in the built environment elicit reflections on the loss of Seattle's soul. This is also a city well known as politically progressive and environmentally oriented. I was interested in learning about how such perceptions of this place emerged, gained traction and contributed to placemaking. I asked, what narratives circulate in and of this place? What are the impacts of prominent stories of this city? How does the Seattle municipal government navigate the contradictions evident in urban space, particularly when prevailing representations of place leave little room for ambiguities? How do systemic inequities and discrimination fit into popular depictions of Seattle? With these questions in mind, my book examines urban governance in Seattle to better understand how specific social values come to fruition and with what impacts. From my experiences living in Seattle and my previous research in the region, I was especially interested in why it often seems that sustainable, just, and creative municipal policies do not necessarily produce sustainable, just, or creative outcomes. Put differently, I wondered why it is that when we work to address inequities, we sometimes further them. I gathered my data through 58 semi-structured interviews, archival research, and participant observation. All the names for the participants are pseudonyms. By using qualitative methods and a geographic perspective to look at not just what policies say, but at how they work in practice, I argue throughout my book that racism and classism along with market-driven mandates seeped into the architecture of many policies and programs and thus constrained the enactment of social values within Seattle's urban governance. Sustainability, creativity, and social justice are all broad terms, so I want to briefly uh, share how I define them and some additional concepts in my book. Sustainability refers to ecologically driven actions that reduce individual and collective use of resources thereby diminishing impacts on biophysical systems and at least conceptually enabling future generations of all species to survive and thrive. Creativity signals the entrepreneurship, innovation, art making and cultural productions evident throughout the city. Many research participants and popular urban writers like Richard Florida suggest that there is something special about Seattle, perhaps the rainy weather that makes it a particularly creative place. 
Social justice as an organizing practice and goal counters the structural, systemic, and institutional reproduction of inequities and marginalization. In my research, the primary site through which I examine the value of social justice is Seattle's Race and Social Justice Initiative, the RSJI. Since the RSJI foregrounds racial justice, that is a particular focus in my analysis as well. Examining racism is fundamental to my research. Within the US context, I understand racism as a spatialized form of oppression that draws on contemporary and historical practices, structures, and processes. Through the linking of power and prejudice, racism accumulates benefit and opportunity to a dominant white racial group. Racism contours all aspects of daily life and operates in the words of Ruth Wilson Gilmore as the quote, ordinary means through which dehumanization achieves ideological normality, end quote. So rather than viewing racism as an aberrant behavior of a few racists, I recognize institutional, structural, and interpersonal forms of racism and grapple with the intersectionality of racism and other categories of difference in my analyses. I conceive of whiteness as a generally unmarked system of power and propertied asset that accrues privilege to white people so as to sustain racialized inequities and racialized privilege. As a human geographer, I approached my research into social values through a geographic perspective and particularly relied upon the concepts of imaginative geographies, place, and spatial scale in my analyses. Imaginative geographies are the assumptions about people in place that we all have. They illustrate idealized representations of Seattle and help me think through how such portrayals both drive and are shaped by urban governance. An example of an imaginative geography is the well-worn narrative of the entrepreneurial spirit of Seattleites. I think about this representation in concert with the evident focus on what's called the creative class. Place is another key entry point in my research. Seattle is clearly a geographical location. Many of you live or have lived in the city. I also think about Seattle in terms of sense of place and the attachments people have to this city. Such affiliations often contribute to our stories about the city, the parts we love and the parts that provoke our frustration. Questions of what and who are quote unquote in and out of place are additional facets of conceptualizing place that thread through my book. In terms of spatial scale, I use this concept to underscore how the translation of sustainability, creativity, and social justice varies if we examine such processes at the scale of the individual as compared to the neighborhood or the city, for instance. Drawing out these differences helps me illuminate some of the barriers to the realization of social values. While there are many different policies or programs that I could have studied, for each social value in my book, I mostly focused on cases that were prominent during my fieldwork. To examine sustainability, for instance, I discussed the Way to Go transportation initiative that encouraged families with at least two cars to give up one car for six weeks and track their transportation patterns, and the green feed debate that emerged in response to a 2008 city council ordinance banning single-use plastic bags. In both of these examples, I analyzed how the design of the program and policy focused on individual choice, even though not all Seattleites have access to the same set of choices. Moreover, these sustainability initiatives were grounded in individual and household choices rather than focused on systemic shifts in greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. So speaking of these choices, the Way to Go Transportation Initiative presumed that families owned at least two cars and lived in neighborhoods with certain characteristics, such as adequate street lighting, available goods within a walkable distance, and bus schedules and routes that aligned with job and other life obligations. This is not the case throughout the city. Yet, the citywide design of the program did not take into account variabilities at the smaller spatial scale of the neighborhood or household, wherein differential access to alternative transportation modalities, for instance, exists. Moreover, riding the bus out of usual necessity did not grant a person access to the Way to Go program. Instead, riding the bus as a choice undertaken to show environmental consciousness did. 
Thus, the benefits of Way to Go and the public accolades for participation were mainly experienced by wealthier residents, producing what I call exclusive inclusion. Such an outcome, I suggest, constrains the realization of sustainability because it positions sustainability within class privilege. This kind of positioning influences how effective sustainability initiatives are and what on the ground transformations are enacted to counter climate change. The exclusive inclusion of sustainability also matters because such framing informs assumptions held about Seattle as a place. As you can see in this, we're so green image from the Office of Sustainability and Environment. Put differently, at the time of my research, imaginative geographies of Seattle's greenness and sustainability foregrounded wealthier and wider residents in part, I illustrate, because of programs that are constructed in ways that limit the inclusion of all residents. The realization of sustainability as a social value is therefore truncated through the privileging of class choices. I do wanna note that these patterns are shifting, especially since the establishment of the equity and environment focus in the Office of Sustainability and Environment in 2015. For creativity, I analyze the implications of conceptualizing creativity as linked to people, products, and processes, and showed that when creativity is enacted as a process, the potential for equitable outcomes increases. I wanna quickly share some examples from these three framings of creativity. As you may know, in his writings about the creative class, Richard Florida advises seeking out and hiring people who work in various professions to enhance the overall economic performance of a neighborhood and city. These are the very same perspectives underpinning the Cultural Overlay District Advisory Committee's report and the initial policy development for Capitol Hill's Cultural District designation. While the focus on creativity as linked to certain people can produce some economic stability and support for arts organizations, it can also implicitly render quote unquote non-creative residents and activities as hindrances to the new branding of the neighborhood. Such a discursive reorganization of a place around this kind of creativity-based economic development can contribute to displacement because people and organizations may leave the area, citing that they no longer feel in place and that the neighborhood no longer feels recognizable to them. As such shifts occur and more capital investment for certain purposes, especially lifestyle amenities deemed attractive to the so-called creative class and more investments in particular sites arise, the possibilities for gentrification also rise. As a case in point, gentrification characterizes many places that enact Florida's creative class economic development strategies. The increases in rent and property values in Capitol Hill over the last decade speak to such trends. Thinking geographically about the creative class focus in the cultural district designation, I highlight how this designation reframes what constitutes Capitol Hill as a place. Accordingly, people and activities that had been present in the neighborhood might become recast as, um, as out of place, as detracting from the new brand. This can lead to material changes in the organizations, businesses, and residents of the neighborhood. Thus, while there is a noted celebration of artists, innovation, and creativity in the cultural district designation, there is also a bounding of what and who comprise this place. The imaginative geographies of Capitol Hill become threaded through a particular lens that positions arts and cultural productions in ways that are deemed beneficial to the economic bottom line which I suggest is a limited way to spark creativity. Through unpacking the development of the cultural district designation in Capitol Hill, I underscore the potential negative consequences produced by foregrounding creativity as linked principally to specific people and activities in economic development endeavors. Framing creativity as tied to products can contribute to the commodification of people as I discuss in my analysis of a retail revitalization plan for Rainier Valley developed by the Community Land Use and Economics CLU organization. This plan primarily focused on leveraging the cultural and ethnic diversity of Rainier Valley for retail development and marketing. I suggest that positioning diversity as a product to be marketed can contribute to the othering of racialized and ethnic communities and affirm whiteness as the norm. Put differently, 
Such marketing strategies can promote harmful, azoticized imaginative geographies of Rainier Valley and offer a fairly narrow representational field for the place. I want to read an excerpt now about the clue marketing ideas for Rainier Valley to illustrate these points. The clue report states that the international businesses of Rainier Valley have loyal customer bases and that such enterprises offer a quote, authentic cultural experience for visitors. Consequently, the authors emphasize the need to preserve and promote quote, the community's international flavor end quote, largely because of the deemed economic growth opportunities associated with this diversity. To this point, Clue recommends developing an image building campaign with taglines tag such as, I slipped away to Mumbai for lunch today. Every Saturday morning, I go to Vietnam. And last night, I went shopping in Mogadishu. The logic is that such representations highlight the internationalism of the valley and draw people into the local businesses. At the same time, such taglines reduce local Rainier Valley restaurants to exotic stops along a global culinary and consumption tour and implicitly rely upon assumptions of foreignness. The conflation of one business in Seattle with an entire city or country in the taglines also contributes to reified representations of place. Furthering notions of exoticism and foreignness, the Clue Report also advocates for passing out free passports to Valley restaurants so that diners can record the key stops on their global tour. Handing out prizes for people who travel the world through their Rainier Valley eating forays is another suggestion. Such theme park type approaches to urban redevelopment disregard the dynamics of the place and situate ethnic restaurants and people of various ethnic backgrounds as commodities. In these recommendations, there is no room for business owners and Valley residents to promote their neighborhoods in the ways they see fit. Instead, a stereotyped and essentialized approach to the neighborhoods and residents underpins the economic development proposals. The suggestions pivot on an assumption that marketing business is all about dollars spent. Meaningful cultural exchange does not maximize profit in a short time frame. In contrast, enticing interest in quote unquote foreign food holds the potential for greater immediate economic results and thus economic development. The linkage of this supposedly innovative and creative retail revitalization plan with the commodification of people and businesses as products demonstrates how such an inculcation of creativity can further existing separations between the racial and class majority residents of Seattle and the people who live in Rainier Valley. So as I note, the clue proposals for marketing uh, foreground creativity as a product as something tied to specific representations of people and small businesses. This can contribute, I suggest, to a furthering of racialized and class stereotypes. Implementing creativity as a social value through revamping processes, however, can produce more equitable outcomes. I demonstrate this point through an examination of a recent Southeast Seattle Equitable Transit Oriented Development, also known as ETOD project. ETOD offers a framework for including a plurality of local residents and economic development plans around transit nodes in order to produce greater equity as compared to traditional transit oriented development, which does not explicitly consider equity and efforts to create dense urban development around public transit hubs. As you may know, Sound Transit has also committed to ETOD in their station developments. So the presence of more equity based transit oriented development is unfolding within and around Seattle. The Southeast Seattle ETOD project I discuss in my book is now called Othello Square. This ETOD project is led by local residents, includes local ownership and management of real estate, centers inclusive decision making, and incorporates a multicultural center. The multicultural center is designed to be the focal point for community activity and opportunity for the eight largest, largest ethnic and cultural groups living in Southeast Seattle. Homesite, the project manager and lead organization in this initiative calls Othello, quote, Othello Square, quote, a creative community driven response to the pressures of extraordinary growth in Seattle, end quote. To my mind, 
This ETOD demonstrates how using creativity as a process to establish a different economic development approach and decision-making structure holds the potential of producing greater social, environmental, political, and economic returns. Mobilizing creativity as a process can also cultivate healing from potent legacies of disenfranchisement and exclusion. As this example underscores, engaging with creativity as a process can positively contribute to the making of more just and equitable places. While I found racism and, and classism match with economic growth pressures often constrain the enactment of sustainability and creativity in Seattle, I noticed the greatest congruence between social justice as a value and as a practice in my examination of the Race and Social Justice Initiative, the RSJI, which was launched in 2004. I argue that unsettling whiteness has been fundamental to the institutional transformations brought about by the RSJI. Unsettling whiteness refers to intentionally disrupting the normative power of whiteness to reproduce racial hierarchies and craft systems, structures, and stances that principally benefit white people. I further use the term unsettling to capture the emotional responses Seattleites had as they realized the popular imaginative geographies of Seattle as a progressive city did not fully match up with lived realities. Unsettling whiteness through the RSJI unfolded across spatial scales from the individual to the department, to the policy, to the institution of city government, to the city of Seattle. Developing mechanisms for unsettling whiteness in such ways was, I suggest, instrumental for actualizing significant change and for aligning social justice and concept and practice. I would like to now read an excerpt about how the RSGI changed city budgeting practices to illustrate how social justice as a value infused the revised budgeting processes. In 2007, then Mayor Nichols asked a group of people to craft a procedure that could produce greater equity within the city budget. There was a noted need to understand department requests, resource allocation, and the overall equity of the financing of the city. As Nichols explained, quote, all of us who work in city government have a role to play in achieving race and social justice for everyone, and the budget process is central to this effort, end quote. In response, an RSJI team created a budget filter, a set of two questions that must be answered for each line item to ensure that city employees consider how financial decisions further or alleviate race-based disparities in institutional racism. The filter asks, quote, one, how does this action accomplish the Mayor's Race and Social Justice Initiative? How did you determine the reasoning for your response? Two, please identify any unintended consequences from this proposal, end quote. The RSJI core team then developed a toolkit to help people understand how to use and respond to the budget filter. The filter was first used in the 2008 budget rounds and continues to guide budget decisions. The process for implementing the budget filter has not been seamless. Lila, another city employee involved in this effort, shared that, quote, some of the budget analysts weren't as diligent. They were just, you know, whatever, end quote, and the first round of the budgeting. But People paid attention when budgets were rejected and resources were not allocated as desired when the filter questions were not addressed. As a result of the broader incorporation of the budget filter, what happens is as departments ask for more money than the base budget, or as they're trying to cut the budget for all the ads or all the cuts, they have to answer these questions on the budget filter, stated Whitney, a city employee also involved in the implementation of the RSJI. This intentional engagement with the distribution of resources and the associated acknowledgement of how such spending or cutting influences various residents of Seattle helps interrupt the flow of business as usual by calling into question financial allocations and producing different resource distribution patterns. As city employee Sierra explained, quote, part of not being business as usual is going to be paying attention to racial impacts and class impacts, end quote. Shifting budgeting constitutes a venue to unsettle whiteness because resources no longer are principally allocated to constituencies that advocate the most vocally or campaign the most actively on their own behalf. Instead, 
resources are spent in ways that bring about greater equity in experiences and opportunities for all residents of Seattle. Transformations in neighborhood planning processes, capacity building trainings for all municipal employees, and language translation policies are additional examples I discuss to show how unsettling whiteness enabled social justice efforts to take root in Seattle's urban governance. All of these endeavors underscore how synergies between efforts, extensive focus on the goals of ending institutional racism and race-based disparities, and honestly confronting and working to change the realities of inequities in Seattle facilitated the notable impacts of the RSJI. Actions premised upon sustainability, creativity, and social justice can be put to work for social change and for the reproduction of class and racialized privilege. Thus, my research on social values and urban governance underscores a broad truth. Unless equity is central to endeavors, inequities are often reproduced. Such a finding disabuses the common assumption that liberal values-driven politics necessarily contribute to equity. Unearthing where and how inequities surface can prompt the crafting of alternative pathways in the practice of social values. My findings matter within and beyond Seattle. Indeed, the deadly realities of racism, classism, and neoliberalism are present in sites throughout the United States, as we see on a daily basis. Crafting relational structures and systems is necessary, given the impacts of climate change, xenophobia, nativism, pandemics, resource exploitation, and staggering inequalities. We all have a role to play in collectively creating more equitable and regenerative places. Taking this to heart helps catalyze our imaginations and build our inner resolve as we struggle to actualize real change. Thank you. And I look forward to continuing our conversation. That was great. Let's all give Professor Sarah Houston a huge round of applause. <laughs> that was really, really great. I, that was great on so many levels. One, just kind of, I think the the definitions, like seeing kind of how you're defining these concepts was really, really productive. I also think, and obviously you kind of mapping through your research. I also think as someone who teaches methods courses, it was a really, really great model mm -hmm. for our students to think about concepts and methods and arguments. And so I really, really appreciate how mm -hmm. clear and skilled that was. Thank you. <laughs> so my first question is, um, Seattle was named after Chief Seattle, Chief South, the Duwamish and Squamish Chief who guided Euro-American settlers in the 1850s. Since Seattle's founding, the city has systemically removed Native Americans within the city. And you talk about, you write about in your book, also across Washington state, the, I think it's the Indian, I forgot what it's called, the Indian Removal Act. I'm saying it wrong, but that forbade marriages. And I know that also it said that like, things that like, if you were a white woman and married to an indigenous man, you would lose your citizenship. So it also like kind of forbade, not only just like marriages, but also like forbade like types of inter interracial relationality. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious about how you think about kind of indigeneity in the research of Imagining Seattle um, and kind of the research that you did over the last almost two decades and how you're thinking about it now. Thank you so much for that question. Um, and my understandings of and my thinking about indigeneity is very much in process as I learn more and evolve as a person and an educator. Um, and so honestly reflecting about my positionality, I find is also crucial for thinking about indigeneity. Uh, and in terms of my, my work in Seattle and my book, um, the silence about indigene indigeneity in the interviews and in the archival research, I think is actually one of the most profound <laughs> findings, if you will. Um, I wasn't explicitly conducting research on indigenous peoples or placemaking in Seattle, yet I think it's revealing that indigenous people surface in conversations only about the Euro-American origin story. Um, about educational disparities, um, or in reference to environmental justice work in the Duwamish River watershed. Otherwise, it was basically silent. Um, and I think that the silence speaks to the normalization of settler colonialism um, and, and how we think about the development of cities um, sort of furthered that as well. So in my, you know, in my book, I, I found myself mostly reflecting upon these silences and, and how it is that indigeneity often arises only when it's the noted focal point 
um, of the research um, and it's not sort of incorporated um, or included or considered um, in you know research about a city more generally and so that's sort of how I continue to think about and, and reflect upon my own work in Seattle. But um, if I may just share a little bit more about how I'm thinking about indigeneity, um, particularly in response to decolonizing knowledge production, um, which has been more of a, a focus for me over the last few years, both in my teaching and in my research. Um, so in terms of, of my teaching, I you know, really think about decolonizing knowledge production in the recognition and um, explicit articulation about um, how higher ed as a structure and institution has deep colonial roots um, and replicates colonial approaches to knowledge production um, in so many ways. And, and so I work uh, from that, I work to try to provide multiple ways of um, forms of assessment in my classes um, to lift up lived and embodied experiences um, to build collectively different kinds of archives and records um, and to ensure that on my syllabi, you know, folks who identify in a wide range of ways and write and create in a wide range of ways are present. Uh, I also find that part for me thinking about indigeneity means um, teaching about reparations um, and encouraging students to deeply consider how they know what they know. Um, what kinds of stories were they socialized in and with um, and particularly in terms of like the US and um, you know how they think about rights and ethics and and what for them constitutes justice and how indigeneity comes to bear there. So, you know, I, um, as you mentioned at the outset, I, I do some research about climate change and human migration as well. Um, and so I think a bunch about what stories are told, um, you know, uh, what what sites are, um, is it useful for me to be present? And when is that just sort of replicating um, extractive neo-colonial forms of knowledge production of kind of going in to learn more about this frontline community and then heading back to my own comfort and my, you know, academic place to write about it. Um, so that's really changed, um, uh, reshaped, I would say, the ways in which I think about my research and what I am actually doing as research. Um, and I also uh, find myself um, in terms of, you know, and Monica, who's on this call, which is great too, um, is partnered in this as well as thinking about with local governments, how do they gather community information um, and how do they run meetings that are supposed to be about, um, you know, collective decision making and in this case in Massachusetts around, you know, disaster preparedness or evacuation routes and, and planning. Why is it that our plans are always written in a very specific way? Could we do something different, like a graphic novel? Mm, that would be interesting. What if we had things, you know, that we had games that were ways in which to gather, you know, people together and to um, solicit information from community residents. So just and what if when we did introductions, it wasn't just, you know, your name and your pronouns. It was actually an opportunity to tell your story and to be present fully with each other in our kind of um, holistic ways. These are all different sort of ways in which that I think about um, decolonizing knowledge production, which of course is very much related to and informed by um, my learnings about indigenous ways of, uh, of being an indigenous uh, life stories and histories and experiences. That's so great. Thank you so much, Saren. That was a really, really beautiful and comprehensive and kind of answer that had so much depth. So I really, really appreciate kind of what you're framing for us and it's expanding how I'm even thinking about those engagements. I want to, before I ask my second question, I want to just name two things. Stephanie, thank you for writing the, the Color of Act, uh, the Color Act of 1855, which is mentioned in Professor Houston's book on page 38. And then also I want to bring up kind of an addendum to this question. Professor um, Mayfield asked about what are your thoughts about real rent programs, citing the real rent real rent Duwamish program where folks often will pay X amount a month to the Duwamish who are indigenous to this area. A great question, Kevin, that's really, really great. What are your thoughts on that, Saren? Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. And to be honest, this is the first time I'm, um, I just pulled up the website. So thank you, Kevin, for sharing that. And then um, this is uh, new for me to learn about. And this guy, I'm, I am excited to hear about these kinds of efforts um, that are thinking about um, um, material financial reparations in a sense or um, acknowledgement of the um, persistence of settler colonialism. Um, and so that it's, I also always think it's 
one of the points that I struggle with is, and this relates a bit to my work about um, when everything becomes framed in this neoliberal uh, format of exchange for financial purposes and just how this does lead to, you know, to, contributes to different kinds of commodification. And I always get sort of nervous about that. And at the same time, there's need for real material financial reparations. And so, um, in the absence of knowing much about um, real rent Duwamish, um, the, uh, this seems like perhaps, and I would love to hear what you all think, a way to um, straddle that, to both have financial reparations while also not kind of furthering a commodification or a, a stereotyping of um, you know, who lives where and how and what that means. Um, it reminds me a little bit, or I, I think it's interesting to think about solidarity economies um, and, you know, and what that, what those entail and what those look like um, and how perhaps some of these efforts, if they're, and maybe they are already blended together, you know, how we might begin to see some actually profound systemic change. Um, That's great. And I, I really appreciate that thinking about, yeah, how you phrase solidarity economies, but also this like straddling of commodification and ways of like financial solidarity. So second question is, especially because we're coming from arts leadership and you know, we are, you know, teaching and researching and doing service in the arts sector. I'm so curious broadly how you think about the arts. And so kind of my official question is, your book so skillfully frames creativity, especially as a critical update to Richard Florida's creative class concept. How are you thinking about the link between kind of creativity as a maybe skill or mindset and the arts in Seattle? And what does this link mean for your research? Thank you. Um, so uh, sort of just even dovetailing with what we were just talking about, um, I register concern in my book about the commodification of art economic development, which I see very much um, but the economic development in terms of just like the financialization, um, what I see very much happening with creative class kind of approaches that are, um, you know, and even Richard Florida's sort of glib response like, oh, there's a lot of inequity produced by this. Well, we'll just say everyone's creative. And it's like, oh, this is just um, feels really as an impoverished approach to thinking about arts and creativity. Um, and, 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 you know, and obviously um, um, areas that have a lot of artists um, are not causing gentrification, yet often the sort of creative endeavors that are there, and particularly if there's emphasis on lifestyle amenities that are seen as attractive for the creative class, um, we can often then see these processes of gentrification and, um, and you know, displacement unfolding. And so I tend to think, and I'm really drawn to, you know, um, understanding and engaging with creativity as a process. Um, and I find that a really generative space um, and I think, you know, and just even what you're just saying of like, what does engagement look like and, and how does it unfold? Um, a processual lens to me um, gives room for a lot of different kinds of relational approaches. So it's not just that there's one kind of approach or one sort of framing that is best or, um, you know, or that there has to be a particular kind of purpose or outcome from certain arts endeavors. Um, personally, I, I find uh, myself most enlivened by the opportunities for creating art for all kinds of reasons and uh, purposes that don't necessarily have to be economic. They could be, but they don't have to be. Um, and that there's opportunities for engaged and embodied expressions um, and, and myriad ways that might be public and they also might be quite private and, um, and they don't have to be kind of um, valued, if you will, by an external audience. Um, and I also find the, you know, in my work of thinking about what changes governance structures, it's often about reimagining um, uh, the, the, the structures that we have in place and the processes and that, you know, and, and sort of even like, what are the steps? So like rethinking budgeting, that really changed a lot of things. Resources moved in different ways. And so the city began to kind of shift in the ways that it um, materially functioned. Um, and I, I see that as a really creative um, expression um, and process. When I was thinking about kind of the, you know, what stories are told about Seattle and uh, what framings are put forward, I was thinking about the WTO um, in 1999, the big protests and uprisings, which really sort of shattered a lot of the public perceptions and imagery of Seattle as this very specific kind of progressive liberal place. And, um, and, and in the kind of um, 
aftermath of that and the, the I would say the you know public embarrassment of city government of like not thinking through you know just being so focused on like wanting to host this event in order to show its world-class you know um, prestige and and um, and kind of importance was you know um, a moment to rethink and then we began to see really strongly a social justice kind of um, push Obviously, it didn't start just there. There had been organizations and groups doing lots of work for decades, but it came into, um, into uh, the municipal government in a way that it hadn't been as prominent before. And so there was this moment of recasting. Um, and, I, and so I trace actually really see that in the WTO as, as a, quite a profound moment of crisis that then kind of prompted um, a shifting and a focus and a cultivating of Seattle as sustainable, creative, and, and, and uh, socially just. But to your question of like, so is this another kind of, um, you know, crisis that can, um, you know, uh, invite some reinventing and recasting and rethinking? Um, I think absolutely. And, you know, personally, the way I, I hope that it comes from and part of what we're learning through these pandemics um, both COVID and, and you know, the, um, the profound uh, uh, examples of systemic racism is that we, that our ethic of care comes to the center and that we really in our kind of rebuilding, if you will, and our reimagining and our recrafting, that, that that's what we bring to the table, not a like defensive, this is mine, or, you know, you're not allowed here, or this is, but that actually through all this, we're like, whew, wow. Like the fragility of of um, of kind of our lives and and uh, our world, at least for me, has become so much um, more clarified. And and so I hope that we can collectively um, come together through an ethics of care, through a relational approach, and um, that is one that is rooted in equity and justice. Because for me, if we like, if if Cap Hill as you know, it has been, you know, pricing folks out and, um, and it's now has, you know, infrastructure um, um, impacts um, that are reflective of, um, you know, the realities of injustices in our world. And, you know, people are responding in a lot of different ways, but these, these infrastructural impacts um, are sort of material representations, if you will, of, um, of people's lived experiences. If we can come together and recraft those you know, through a model of equity and an ethic of care, like, wow, speaking of, you know, the question of hope, that feels super hopeful. Um, then in that, you know, um, entrepreneurs, you know, innovators, um, I just think about what collaborative possibilities could be there. Um, and that feels really exciting. Um, and so I hope that there is a remaking of maybe even Cap Hill's little, you know, district itself, in, in addition to kind of city government more generally. One of my concerns and what um, a bunch of folks, you know, when I interviewed them, you know, years ago said too, is that if we, again, are mostly concerned about our financial bottom line, a lot of these other things just are going to fall to the wayside. So I think that'll be a big tension as Seattle moves forward is, you know, can the city imagine itself with less kind of economic largesse? and much more equity and solidarity and ethics of care, to me, that would be amazing. Um, and certainly worthy of, um, you know, considered uh, uh, further study, you know. Um, so you'll have to keep me posted on what's happening because um, I'll be curious to hear uh, as things unfold. Great, thank you so much. Let's all give a round of applause to Professor Sarah, Sarah Houston. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both, Professors Mahmood and Houston. Um, this was amazing.